Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a few more minutes to uh, settle in and we'll get started. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started on the webinar and the presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. We really appreciate it. Um, and the topic today that we're going to be talking about is how to prepare for college. And we're giving a whole rundown about the college process until the first day of classes. And so this is a two part series and this is just part one and tomorrow or on Friday we're going to have part two. So we're going to head going to go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm Bethany Martinez. I'm an intern here at TLT, an instructional design intern. And um, another person that helped me prepare this is Hi, I'm Carly. I'm also an instructional design intern for TLT. And TLT, Tomorrow's Leaders Today, is a 50C, 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping develop youth leaders through education, collaboration, and mentorships with community and business leaders, leaders for the collective benefit of students and their communities. Yay. Thank you for that, Carly. Um, and so I just wanted to say that we have a Q&A session afterwards, so if you have any questions or concerns or anything about the presentation or even TLT, uh, you can drop those uh, below in the Q&A section and at the end we'll go ahead and answer those questions. So let's go ahead and get started. So how to prepare for college. All right, and here are some of the topics we'll be talking about. So going from applying to college, the financial aid aspect, orientation, dorming and moving out, and even some uh, uh, parts about remote learning. We're not really gonna go into that much. That's more gonna be uh, in our next presentation. And so applying for college, when you're choosing a college, it's really important to think um, about all these different aspects about that university. There's so many colleges out there and you really have to hone in on a few that are going to be the ones that you really like. And that's gonna take a lot of exploration, even exploring yourself. So you can consider factors like how far is it from your home, uh, the majors that they have, the cost of attendance, that's a big one, the environment, how you feel around it, um, and also the financial aid available to you, especially uh, certain schools offer scholarships, um, and for you specifically. And so that could be uh, a factor when choosing your college. So it's important to consider so many factors um, so you can find a place that really aligns to who you are and where you feel comfortable being. And um, picking where you are uh, going for college is, it's tough, it's hard. It takes a lot of thought, uh, it takes a lot of thought 
and you almost feel like you have to choose the right decision, but whichever one feels most right for you um, would be good and aligns with what you need um, for your career path. And so, yeah, um, a note down here that's really important is making sure that you choose an accredited, uh, accredited program. And this is a school that has a program that's approved by an, uh, an accreditation program. And yeah, just making sure that's it because jobs really look for that. And that pretty much makes your um, diploma in a way official and uh, standardized the kind of uh, education that you had. And so when choosing a college, there's different kinds of college you um, that are available for you. And so I'm going to talk about these on the outside a bit, and then we'll get into community college. So first, a private university. Um, this one tends to be the most expensive since they aren't um, funded by the government. And they often have small class sizes. So that's usually um, a perk that people look into when uh, choosing it. And so uh, a four year uh, de degree program is often offered granting a bachelor's degree. They also offer uh, higher education or uh, graduate school degrees as well. Uh, same for public university. So let's go ahead and talk about public university. This one tends to be uh, less expensive than a private university since it is funded by the government. And um, as opposed to private universities, uh, class sizes are usually larger. Um, some universities you may find have uh, still smaller class sizes as a public university. Um, I know TWU uh, tends to be not too large in that as well. And so a four year degree program is offered as well as a higher um, graduate classes as well. Uh, definitely check on the specific university for that. And then talking about out of state schools. Out of state schools are more expensive if you come from a state that's not within, that doesn't, hmm, I don't know what to say. So if you're in a state such as Texas and you want to go to Oklahoma, um, it's going to be more expensive to be a, um, a resident of Texas and wanting to attend in Oklahoma. And so that it, it just tends to be more expensive due to that. Um, so definitely look at that whenever you're looking um, at an out of state school and considering that. And these can be both private and public. And there, there can also be community colleges as well. Um, and so community colleges are, they usually offer two year programs that will grant uh, associate degrees or uh, trade certifications upon completion. And this one is um, definitely the least expensive option. Um, this is also good if you wanna uh, just do your first two and do your core classes and then move on to a either a public or a private or an out of state university for a four year program, just so you can save some money as well. Um, and also just be closer, but there, Community colleges do not have dormitories usually or any sort of uh, housing and most people commute. And so talking about starting the application. So in Texas, we often use Apply Texas. Um, and this is like a portal that you can have all your uh, information that the university requires you to offer them when it comes to making an application um, in enrolling to the university you're looking into. So um, within each application, schools will ask for this unique info and uh, it's important to check each of the requirements because each university uh, requires different things for you to offer them, different information, different documents. So make sure that you're looking into the details for that. Um, yeah, and then also a uh, common app it's um, another portal that's also used. Um, and you see this outside of Texas and you see most schools use Apply Texas in Texas. Um, and so, yeah, this is just another uh, portal option. All right, so supporting documents, your high school transcript, I'll, I'll say by far like all universities uh, require this. 
uh, you can request it from your school's uh, counseling center. Um, they have these documents at your high school recording um, your four years and all your grades then, and that will be given to your university. And so when you're, apply, you're applying for college, your transcripts will initially be sent as incomplete until the school year has ended. So once the school year has ended, you have all your um, grades, your GPA, your class rank, everything is on it and completed and sent to your university. And most of the time they'll do that for you. If you feel like uh, you're concerned, you can always check in with your school counselor or whoever is in charge of your high school transcript. Your supporting documents, such as your uh, immunization record. Uh, this is for your meningitis shot. And you're going to have to take a meningitis vaccine or a booster shot to be able to enroll into college. And this is within five years of enrollment. So if you took it uh, two years before enrolling to college, then you don't have to take it. You, you just have to make sure it's within five years of being enrolled in a university. If you end up having to take a break from university for, let's say, five years, uh, you're going to have to take your uh, meningitis shot again to make sure that you are uh, clear on that. And so there's many requirements here down below um, of how you can have that record be approved. Most of all, you need a signature or some sort of stamp of approval with a date um, from your physician uh, to have this record be approved because otherwise um, they're, they're going to ask for that. It cannot be approved unless it has some sort of signature and date on it. Um, and yeah, you can get it from other sources, uh, get an official record from other sources that are approved. Um, some exemptions, if you're an online student, your, your university or uh, college will not require you to uh, take your meningitis vaccine. Uh, and you wouldn't have to offer that documentation. But if you do choose to end up going physically, then you will. Also, if you're, you have any health risks and you're over the age of 22. Um, so just like make sure that you're checking any exemptions and uh, details about that because there's more exemptions to that as well. And just verifying uh, with your university if you have any questions. Uh, supporting documents again, so we're looking at SAT, ACT, and TSI scores. These are your test scores that are pretty much going to tell the university if you are academically ready to take on college course load, the college course load. So um, yeah, most colleges will require either an SAT or an ACT scores, uh, their standardized tests to see if you're ready for college. Um, and yeah, they'll accept either your SAT or ACT. Uh, it's definitely important, once again, to check your university and what they require and making sure that you have um, all the documents that they need specifically for that university. Not all universities are the, the same with it, but most of them are quite similar. So SAT scores, when you register for the SAT, you have an option of sending the scores directly to the college for free. Um, that does save money. Um, but if you wait until after you've received your score, you'll be charged an additional fee. Um, so definitely consider that. Um, that's why it's good to look at colleges um, before taking it a bit more, uh, taking the SAT, I mean. And so that's just an option there as well. Uh, supporting documents again, let's see TSI scores. The TSI is an assessment uh, assessed to help your college or university determine if you're ready for a college level course load in reading, writing, and mathematics. So if you're going to college in Texas, it is important to make sure that you have met these scores on the SAT, ACT, as well as the STAR test, as this shows if you're ready to take on college course load. Um, and the TSI is, um, so if you get a bad score in one of the sections in your SAT, for example, let's say uh, writing, they're going to have you take this assessment called the TSI. And in the TSI, you just prepare for this uh, assessment. 
you take it at either a uh, university or um, at your school, just make sure you're uh, talking to your counselor or whoever is uh, probably like uh, definitely your teachers as well. They'll know about this um, and verifying what locations could you take it from and where do you need to sign up and just verifying you have all that information so you can be successful um, and take the TSI if you did not do well in a certain section in some of these tests. Um, and if you do not pass the TSI or don't take it at all, you will be required to take developmental courses before starting your, your basic core classes in university. And these are just supposed to uh, help you and make sure that you have an understanding of um, more higher level material. Um, and I didn't really include the ACT. It's kind of going into uh, the SAT. Um, here, it's very similar. I do know that it that you're able to send your scores to them as well. It's through College Board, so it is a very similar process. Definitely check um, the directions there as well to help you out with that. Um, AP scores. So this is also through College Board, and. Here, um, when applying to colleges, you can self-report your AP scores on your applications, and you should only have to send an official report once you've committed to attending the university. And so um, this is pretty much saying, um, you know, you can tell the university that you had these scores. However, um, once you are at the university, you need proof that you did do that and you're able to send these AP scores over to them. Um, to be exempt from different college courses. So for example, if you got a certain score on your, let's say AP government test, a US government test, then you will be exempt from taking it in university if you reach a certain score. Um, it's important to check on your university's website. What is the, the score requirement that they're going to need? Because this is a case by a case basis for each college. Uh, one university may say you need a three, one university may require you to have a five. So definitely make sure you're checking that university's website. Um, I, I really vouch for their websites. Please use their websites. They have a lot of information. I know a uh, phone anxiety is a thing too. Um, if, if you're able, get a parent or someone to help you out with that, because I think calling their offices as well is really helpful and you can get a lot of information. And we're going to go over like the different offices that there are. So um, in our second presentation, so you know who to talk to. All righty. Um, and you should only. Yeah. OK, so let's go into this point when uh, taking the AP test. There is a spot on the AP answer sheet to list the college you want uh, your current and past scores to be sent to. Um, and so you can also send the scores to your university directly through College Board. Those are lots of options. All righty. You're going to have Carly take over now. OK, I'm going to talk about some of the financial aspects of college. So the first and most important, one of the most important things to know is the FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. It's used to determine your financial aid from the government and most colleges. Uh, the FAFSA collects personal and financial information from the students and parents. It's important to apply for FAFSA as early as possible. It opens October 1st every year. Um, most universities will require you to fill out the FAFSA in order to um, grant you scholarships, loans, and grants. Um, loans, uh, many students will also take out loans to pay for college. It's important to be as informed as possible about loans. Um, for the first time you take out loans, most universities will require you to do a loan um, course, just like go over um, the different types of loans you can take out, repay, um, repayment plans, and so you have like a basic understanding before you take out a loan. Um, credit cards. Most students are 18 when they enter college and have their first opportunity to apply for credit card to help pay for any of like your financial needs during college. So it's important to kind of understand what goes into a credit card, the different aspects of paying back your um, the money you put on a credit card as well. Um, TLT has presentations on 
over all of these three topics, they can get a more in-depth um, look at all of them. Um, so these are some of the financial courses that TLT offers. We have one about balancing a checkbook, what goes into a credit score, and the introduction over FAFSA. Orientation and registration and what to expect. You'll be walked through the basics of becoming a college student during orientation. Uh, it generally occurs during the summer and gives an opportunity to explore campus, services, classrooms, and dorms. Be sure you know what dates uh, orientation are offered, as well as if there's any fees that are required. Course offering, student ID. Typically during orientation, you'll get your ID picture. Um, it's important to have your ID um, with you because a lot of times to get into different events on campus and sometimes even into specific buildings, you'll be required to have an ID. And a lot of times if you want a student discount um, from different uh, stores, um, you'll be required to show your student ID. Advising during orientation, you'll have a chance to speak with an advisor for the first time. Typically, this will be done in a group setting for people who are in the same major as you, and they'll walk through what the next four years are supposed to look like and like the different courses you'll be taking. Um, you'll also get an opportunity to start picking out your classes and start signing up. And you'll also get a chance to explore the campus and meet other students and faculty. Dorming and moving out. On-campus housing tends to fill up fast, so it's important to register for housing as soon as you make a decision about your housing and where you're going to attend school. You will have a chance to choose your housing as well as your roommate if you are early. Choosing the best housing for you and your budget. There are many different options for housing, such as dorms, student apartments, and living at home. It's important to decide which option is best for you as there are pros and cons for each option. Uh, dorming is typically a little bit more expensive than the other options, but there's a lot of convenience about um, at living directly on campus. It's a lot easier to walk right out of your door and walk straight to your class. Uh, student apartments, um, if you're living far away, it's you have more privacy than you have in a dorm, but then you also have to think about if you're renting an apartment for the whole year versus just for the time you're at school. And living at home is definitely the cheapest option. Choosing a roommate, co-living. If you're living in a dorm, you'll have to pick a roommate as single rooms are very rare for freshmen. It's important to try and choose someone you'll be able to live with and coexist with. Your roommate does not have to be your best friend, just someone you can live with with minimal problems. Finding a roommate. Many colleges provide roommate matching services that allow you to fill out an application. There are also school Facebook pages um, that people often post looking for roommates. Um, it's important to know your living preferences and communicate with other students about that so that way you can find someone you're compatible to live with. Um, thank you for attending. Um, please visit TLT for more resources. One of the resources we have provided is um, for all of the universities that TLT has partnered with, we have found, we've gone through their websites and provided links for everything that's related to the topics that we have um, discussed in this presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Carly. And yes, thank you for attending. Um, we're just going to go through the Q&A and uh, see what questions people have right now. Um, one moment, I'm going to go over here into the contact us section. So if you would like to screenshot this or um, just take note of it, this is how you can contact TLT and get to know more about our resources and what we can offer you. Um, as you see that there are also courses that, um, they, that we offer on the website. And so you can uh, take a look at that. Um, over here, of course, if you also want to screenshot right now, the TLT link, so you can um, go ahead and uh, look at those resources and courses that are on there. Um, alrighty, so I'm going to go into the Q&A, and I'm going to have Carly read the questions, and I'm going to go ahead and answer them. 
Okay, Alrighty. The, mm -hmm. okay, the first question is, what exactly is an accredited university and why is it important? Okay, gotcha. Um, so an accredited university is uh, one that has been uh, approved by an uh, accreditation program. These uh, or uh, agencies, these agencies are um, overlooked by the government in making sure that the minimal requirements, the uh, standards that are met inside that uh, education program. And so this is really important to have um, in your university, making sure that you're choosing a university that actually has this. Um, so whenever you do choose a job, they know that you came from a university that um, did meet these standards and um, we're teaching exactly what um, the government or the, these accreditation programs would approve of. And so, yeah, it's really important to make sure that your, your school is doing that. Um, as some schools, all, there's actually schools out there that, that aren't approved of that. So making sure of that. Alrighty, what's the next question, Carly? How can I find out if a university is accredited? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And so um, the United States Department of Education uh, Office, let me make sure I'm saying this right. Hold on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Post secondary of post secondary education. Um, they have a list of accredited programs that you can look at. Um, and just verifying that we'll drop that really long name in the chat so you all can get it um, and look up what uh, programs are accredited. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And yeah, looking through that list and making sure that uh, the university you choose or the program that they have uh, aligns with that. Uh, what is the next question, Carly? What is the difference between state and private universities? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, we got on for this a little bit. Um, so yeah, state universities are um, funded by the government. They're larger and um, they're cheaper than our private universities that we have. Private universities uh, don't typically offer um, or uh, don't typically receive funding from uh, the government. So they're going to be more expensive. That's really those are really the things that stand out. They have smaller classes and um, yeah, they're just really, they're, they're smaller um, campuses and uh, you have smaller classes. So if, if you feel comfortable being in a place that has less people, that's probably a good option for you. Um, also look at different public universities because there are some that are, do have uh, small class sizes too. Um, but yeah, private universities tend to be larger. Uh, you have a lot more uh, people there. And so if you're, if you're a person that's uh, comfortable with those huge class sizes, go ahead. You got the, the uh, state universities there. All righty, what's the next question? Do I have to declare a major right away? Oh, uh, no, you do not. Uh, you're, you are able to enroll as an undeclared. Um, and with this, you all you really have to focus on are your um, core classes and making sure you're getting those done. Um, and those classes, your core classes, everyone needs to take them. Everyone needs to make sure that they meet those requirements. Um, so you don't really have to care about your major yet. It's good to start thinking about it and start exploring those majors. But no, whenever you're a freshman, especially like, um, yeah, you can go in as an undeclared and just go ahead and try to explore. Uh, what is the next question? What are core classes? Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, that's a, that perfectly leads on. So um, core classes, they are required for from all college students. And um, these usually talk about core subjects such as uh, math, science, history, English. And yeah, those are, um, it's pretty much like inside um, high school whenever you just had to do reading, writing, science, um, and math and yeah. Uh, what is the next question? How do you know what college environment is good for you? Mm. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, personally, for me, like, uh, it was intuitive to kind of figure it out. Like, I really liked the buildings, the people, the events that they offered, and I, I liked how, like, uh, the university was. Um, and so, like, I guess what I could say is, like, 
um, just get a gauge for the environment. Um, and you can you usually have opportunities to do this through uh, university tours where you can tour the school or college tours. You can uh, tour a community college and see if it's something you like. Get to know the faculty, the staff, the people that work there. Uh, get to know some of the students. Uh, just look at the environment. Do you like the environment? Do you like the classrooms? Do you like how um, maybe someone helped you in the hallway? Uh, that could be a factor. Uh, and yeah, just get get a feel for the environment, the events. Do you like the events that they offer? And just, yeah, see in a way if you, you vibe with it, if it's a good environment for you. Alrighty, what's the next question? For orientation, what if I plan to enroll during the spring semester? Will they have an orientation for us to attend? Gotcha. Mm. Yeah, okay. So it depends on your school. Um, because some schools do offer orientations during the winter. Um, but yeah, the larger scale orientations, just because most students uh, enter in the fall semester, uh, large orientations are usually during the summertime. And so, yeah, you really have to look at your university's website, contact uh, student life, maybe um, or the office that uh, really connects with like uh, student activities. Um, and uh, making sure that it is during the time that you need it. I know that there are university tours. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. So that's another option that you can look into when it comes to like getting a feel for the school. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Okay, uh, the next question mm -hmm. is, what are the developmental courses that were mentioned in the TFI section? Gotcha. Let me see. Mm, yeah. So for that section, math, reading and writing, whenever, mostly like subjects that are on the SAT, um, those are really the focal sections that uh, the TSI looks at. And so, yeah, math, reading, and writing, they are uh, prerequisites um, that are supposed to help you gain knowledge and skills to do standard courses. So just making sure that um, you are taking those courses, you're signing up for those courses, you're pretty much defaulted for, uh, to those courses if you do not take the uh, TSI section. Um, but yeah, you're going to have them over math, reading, and writing. Oh yes, what are the, what's the next question? <laughs> when should I start applying for college? Yeah, so uh, most people do this um, around their senior year. It is preferred that you start the summer before your senior year um, or even earlier um, because the more prepared you are, the more you're able to think clearly about your decision and not just making a uh, snap impulsive decisions. So it'll give you enough time to gather materials, um, and not feeling overwhelmed and rushed. If you're applying to college after you graduated high school, it's best to start the application process the semester before you want to start. So um, for example, like if you don't wanna go during your fall semester and you wanna go until the spring, uh, make sure that you're applying during the fall season to get into your spring semester. Um, and, and that goes for like people who want to start in the summer, you're uh, like start university in the summer after graduating, you're going to have to start preparing in um, a lot more, like probably into your junior year a bit more uh, to help make sure that you're going in the university you want to. Um, and yeah, making sure you have everything in order. It's also important to pay attention to application deadlines. And so uh, they have different terms. Each university can offer different terms. Like some offer like winter semester, uh, winter semesters. I think that's how you say them. Um, and so making sure that you're meeting the deadlines for those uh, semesters you want to apply for. Um, yeah, just just make sure that you're you're preparing like a whole season ahead, pretty much, um, preferably earlier. Um, and yeah, making sure you're meeting those deadlines. What is the next question, Carly? <laughs> When can I get my student ID? Oh, okay. So uh, you can do this before school starts. 
please get it before school starts. Uh, some universities don't let you even have housing until you have your ID. Um, and when getting your ID, make sure that you have some sort of state ID. This can just be um, your driver's license or um, just a general state ID um, to make sure that you can apply for that. There are different offices uh, or depending on your school and whatever title it's called, there's like specific offices that um, deal with ID services. Uh, sometimes they're just called ID service office. Um, and going to that office and making sure you have a printed uh, ID that has your photo and uh, your ID number on it. And you're going to, um, like Carly mentioned earlier, it's important to have that because you cannot access certain events or buildings um, if you don't have that. What is the next question, Carly? <laughs> How does housing or roommates pertain to me if I want to live at home? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So um, if you seek to live at home, the only roommates you have to really be concerned about are the people you live with. This could be your family, friends, whoever you choose to live with, uh, roommates that are apartment mates. Um, and you just have to verify beforehand though, if you, especially if you're a freshman or under the age of um, like 21. I know um, at certain universities, uh, they don't let you live off campus if you live uh, too far off of campus. Uh, like maybe you live all the way in a different town than your university. They, as a freshman, most of the time they'll offer or uh, require you to live in that university, you have a dorm or live very, very close to it. So make sure you're checking the housing requirements um, of living off campus. Uh, checking in with the housing office, I think would be very good for this one. Uh, and seeing if you as a freshman are allowed to live uh, off campus, because if you, if you live too far or you're under a certain age, uh, they might not let you uh, live off campus. So please check in with that. It's uh, university by university for that. Uh, excuse the buzzing. Um, and yeah. So uh, what is the next question, Carly? Um, the last question is, how do I decide what clubs and organizations to be involved in? Okay, okay. So really look into your interests. Uh, look into what you like to uh, like to do. Um, universities offer a wide variety of clubs and uh, organizations that you can get involved with. Um, so you definitely look at what you're interested in and you'll have an opportunity to meet a bunch of other people that are also interested in that and uh, possibly have the same purpose of being there. Um, so definitely look into that. You meet new people, you get more familiar with the campus. It's, it's really nice. Uh, personally, I, I like joining clubs and organizations because I meet a lot of new people. Um, and yeah, you can also start your own club. That's an option. You can start your own club. And so um, with this, you're going to have to get an advisor and help you uh, set this up. With, I'm not really sure who you can talk to about uh, starting a club, um, but I definitely have seen people do it and it's, it's really great, especially when you see something or you don't see something on campus and you really want it to be there and create a community around that. So yeah, that's definitely something to look into. Um, are there any more questions, Carly? Uh, no, that, that was it? the last one. Okay, cool, gotcha. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, definitely check TLT's website for those resources. Um, and yeah, I, thank you all for coming and I hope you have a great day. I'll, I'll let you all uh, exit and everything. Um, yes, alrighty.